Dr. Jarvik is uh, known to most of you, I think, as our professor in radiology, and he has actually looked into some uh, very common conventions as the diagnostic quandaries of how to manage back pain. So from a radiologist's perspective, please take the lead here. Well, thank you, uh, Jens and, and Randy, for in inviting me to uh, talk at this course. I really appreciate it. Uh, so Jens tasked me with uh, uh, the quest answering the question, does uh, MRI show low back pain? And um, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, actually, I was, maybe you should spend the time, uh, I thought I might actually spend the time talking about uh, a non-controversial issue, which is a recent study that our group published on vertebroplasty and low back pain, but uh, that actually will have to wait for some other time. Uh, we'll talk about this non-controversial issue, which is the use of MR for selecting patients uh, for surgery. Just some disclosures. Uh, what I will spend the bulk of the talk talking about is imaging nomenclature. Uh, and then uh, talk a bit about uh, the prevalence of various imaging findings uh, that we discuss. So I just want you to imagine for a second that you're seeing a patient in your office who is a runner and has knee and back pain and, and think about uh, a bit about the differential diagnosis uh, for this sort of patient. Um, and actually here's our first audience response question. So what's the most likely diagnosis? Um, given the very limited information that you have, herniated disc with root compression, spinal stenosis, or discogenic instability. Just to see how people would answer. Okay, interesting. So I would uh, bet, and we can go back to our slides, that um, Nobody thought of this as the cause of somebody's low back and leg pain. And this is, I think, emblematic of the problem that we have with MR uh, and looking at it as a cause, MR findings, the cause of what people have um, uh, symptomatically is that uh, what you think about isn't necessarily what appears on the imaging study. There's a tremendous amount of controversy about the clinical re relevance of various imaging <laughs> findings. I think that the place to start, really, is agreeing on common terminology and that to make sure that we're using the same terms to describe things that you're using. Uh, and luckily, we're in pretty good shape here. Uh, it's been uh, almost a decade now since Pierre uh, Millet, who's a neuroradiologist and Farden, a surgeon, uh, came up with this consensus nomenclature, and it's really been adopted by every society that deals with low back pain. Uh, and so I'm just going to briefly review this. Now, this is a drawing that my daughter did uh, about, uh, it says, an insurmountable amount of homework, and I would hate to have this mound. And fortunately, this nomenclature is simple, and it's relatively easy to use, and is not an insurmountable amount of homework. Uh, and what is this consensus nomenclature? Well, essentially, uh, you can divide the MR findings into normal or abnormal, and abnormal consists of degeneration, annular fissures, please don't call them annular tears, and herniation. And we'll go through this uh, one by one. Actually, here's next audience response question. So a disc protrusion, one is a type of disc herniation, uncommon in people without low back pain, has the largest diameter adjacent to the parent disc, something to be embarrassed about at parties, or one and three. And good. So um, half of you chose uh, that it's a type of disc herniation and has the largest diameter adjacent to the parent disc, and I'll explain what that means in just a second. We can go back to I control it. So the consensus nomenclature defines a disc herniation as a localized displacement of disc material. More than half the circumference of the disc, it's a bulge, less than half the circumference of the disc, it's defined as a herniation. Herniations have been further subdivided into these categories of protrusion and extrusion. And just schematically here, normal disc uh, displayed in blue, the bony end plate in white, the canal in yellow, a bulge, a diffuse abnormality of the disc, a protrusion, again, is a local abnormality of the disc, less than 50% of the circumference, but the largest diameter is adjacent to the parent disc. Uh, 
This is in distinction to an extrusion, which essentially has a neck on it. And so the largest diameter is not adjacent to the parent disc. So protrusion, extrusion, pretty straightforward. Uh, example on an axial T2 weighted MR, you can see small central protrusion. Actually, this person has an annular fissure here, which is high signal. Uh, on a sagittal, weighted image, uh, sagittal T2 weighted image, the, uh, uh, this shows a nice disc extrusion. Again, the largest diameter of the disc material not adjacent to the parent disc. Uh, and this, this patient actually also has some end plate change or modic change and type, two, type 1 end plate change, high signal on the T2 weighted image, um, which is also part of the consensus nomenclature. But just to, again, get back to protrusions and extrusions, extrusion has a neck, protrusion doesn't. This is just purely a morphological distinction based on the MR appearance on the axial images. And this neck actually can be present either in the axial or in the sagittal plane. Uh, and you can see largest diameter not adjacent to the parent disc. And here you can see it starting to come into the lateral recess and get the exiting nerve root and compressing it. So whenever you're presented with a classification, the first question that you should ask is, how reliable is this classification? Uh, a, a widespread statistic for looking at the reliability is something called the kappa, which takes into the agreement that one would expect to have by chance. You're generally shooting for kappas around 0.6, and the reliability of this classification is pretty good as classifications go, with intra-reader kappas in the substantial range and the inter-reader reliability, meaning between two different observers, is in the high moderate to substantial range. So pretty good reliability. There's a fundamental problem, though, that we have when we look at MRIs uh, with a lumbar spine is that there are all sorts of things that we can see. Many of them have a very poor association with pain. We did a study uh, a number of years ago now, boy, nearly a decade ago now, uh, out at the Seattle VA, um, <laughs> which we called the Longitudinal Assessment of Imaging and Disability of the Back study or the laid back study. It's probably my proudest achievement as an academic coming up with that acronym. And what we did was we, we tried to identify uh, patients who did not have current low back pain. Now, for those of you who practice in the US uh, and understand what the VA population is like, it's very difficult to find 150 people who don't have low back pain currently. We actually literally went through thousands of potential subjects to identify this 150 that did not have low back pain. We rigorously screened them to make sure that they didn't have low back pain going through medical records, doing phone-based questionnaires, interviewing them in person, doing a physical exam in person to make sure that they actually did not have low back pain. Um, currently, they could have had low back pain in the past. Um, and um, I'll get into that a little bit later. We, obtained an MRI on them at baseline, and then we followed them longitudinally uh, and uh, followed them for three years and then repeated the MRI at the end of three years. And that way we were able to look at not only what the baseline prevalence was of various imaging findings, um, but also how they predicted the development of future pain, how they were correlated with prior pain. And that's some of the data that I'm going to uh, go through in just a little bit. Um, we'll go to this third audience question, a patient with low back and leg pain without significant stenosis. Given the appropriate clinical picture, would you operate on a patient to treat a black disc, bulging disc, disc protrusion, disc extrusion, all of the above, none of the above? So no right answer to this question. This is just... Uh, just to see what the distribution is. So interesting, a disc extrusion um, uh, had the most votes, um, uh, and then none of the above. Um, even they, though they had the appropriate clinical picture. Well, we'll go through these imaging findings um, one by one now, uh, and see why those answers uh, actually make some sense. Can we switch back to my slides? Thanks. So the prevalence of disc findings in subjects without low back pain is a fundamental issue that, that you deal with every day. Uh, and as you can see, different imaging findings have different prevalence in people without pain. Uh, 
Bulges are extremely common, and this again was from our study, but has been demonstrated in numerous other studies in the literature. Uh, protrusions are still quite common, um, although less so, and extrusions are distinctly uncommon. And I think this shows the value of making that distinction in the nomenclature between a disc protrusion and extrusion in that extrusions are uncommon in people without low back pain. Uh, as I said, other people have shown this in the literature going back to the myelography uh, literature in the 1960s and then with CT and the number of studies with MR showing uh, herniations and the early studies did not distinguish between protrusions and extrusions uh, were quite, quite common and extrusions distinctly uncommon. And so the, the, the take home message is that it being uncommon, extrusions are likely to be the more clinically relevant finding than disc protrusions. What about disc degeneration? Uh, disc degeneration uh, as defined by signal loss on the T2 weighted images or a black disc uh, and height loss, uh, again, uh, a finding that uh, is, is frequently seen and frequently attributed to people's low back pain. This is one of our study subjects from the laid back study. Um, uh, actually, three of our study subjects, all of which show degenerated discs, so signal loss at one or even multiple levels, uh, as well as height loss, as well as some disc bulging in some cases, none of these patients had low back pain. Prevalence of disc degeneration in people who don't have low back pain, extraordinarily high and related to aging. And so uh, over a certain age, you could say that you're distinctly abnormal if you don't have a degenerated disc. In our cohort, over 90% of subjects had disc degeneration of at least one level. And in some studies, it's been 100%. What about annular fissures? Uh, and annular fissures, also called annular tears or HIZs, high intensity zones, those latter two terms are not part of the official nomenclature and we're trying to get them out of our reports. Uh, annular tears, especially because people associate the word tear with trauma and attribute a tear to, erroneously attribute a tear to having had an episode of uh, prior trauma. Um, this is part and partial of degeneration uh, and are going to be high signal that you can see on a T2 weighted image. A um, number of authors have looked at the prevalence of annular fissures uh, in patients without, in subjects without low back pain. Again, quite prevalent, somewhere between 50, 15 and, and 30 percent or even more in some studies. And so how do you, how do you make sense of all of these findings of of uh, annular fissures and disc bulges and protrusions and extrusions and facet hypertrophy uh, and try and put it into some sort of meaningful classification. Well, I think it might be helpful to look at those findings that are related to normal aging, those findings that are related uh, to prior low back pain, which is information that we've had uh, in our studies, and those that are common. Uh, and disc bulges, uh, facet hypertrophy, uh, anterolist or retrolisthesis um, are related to aging and are common findings and are so not incredibly useful, not very useful findings uh, when trying to associate uh, with patient symptoms. Uh, disc uh, desiccation or low T2 signal um, is uh, related to aging, common. Actually, in our study, we found it was prob probably related to prior low back pain, but again, not very useful because it's so common. Uh, annular fissures and protrusions, very common findings, uh, not necessarily related to aging, which is interesting. Um, but again, because they're so common, not so useful. And then finally, the three things that clinically are worth focusing on are related to prior low back pain, related to back pain, not common, not related to aging, and those are disc extrusions, nerve root compression, uh, and moderate or severe uh, central stenosis. Uh, and so the take home points regarding prevalence and really what imaging findings are most relevant to somebody's low back pain are one, that many findings are common in people without low back pain, but certain findings are more likely related to low back pain and probably the most clinically important, those are extrusion stenosis and root compromise and what you focus on on a daily basis. And just as a way of a post test, since we've gone through this, um, would you classify this as a normal bulge, protrusion, or extrusion?
And notice I did not give you the choice of an annular fissure, because you can see that obviously here. And a, a protrusion, excellent. excellent. And then the next, uh, the last question is, how would you classify this? Normal bulge, protrusion, or extrusion? Just to see if people were paying attention. Excellent. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, let's move on here, Mike. Um, I think what we'll do now is, is, is move right into Mike's uh, presentation of degenerative spondy and stenosis, laminectomy or, or, or laminotomy. Um, we'll save the case discussion for the discussion period. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. So uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis and stenosis, laminectomy or laminotomy. So there's pretty sufficient evidence in the, liter uh, in the literature that for a degenerative spondylolisthesis in the lumbar spine, the spinal stenosis, specifically a mobile spondylolisthesis, this is uh, treated optimally with some form of stabilization along with concurrent decompression. Decompression alone is generally associated with worse outcomes. And for uh, some of the long-term uh, long results from these uh, Herkowitz series, um, a fusion or a strong radiographic fusion has been correlated with a uh, good clinical result for long-term patients with a mobile degenerative spondylolisthesis. So what we can con conclude from these studies is that decompression alone is not indicated for an unstable spine. Kind of begs the question, what is instability? Are all forms of degenerative spondylolisthesis unstable? And I think all of us in the room probably know what instability is, something we can all readily identify, but perhaps not describe so well in specific radi radiographic criteria. Back in the 1970s and 80s, we used to think that three millimeters of displacement and nine degrees of angulation was a form of instability. We soon later realized that almost 50% of asymptomatic patients have as much as three millimeters of motion on flexion extension views. So maybe it's not right to call it three, uh, use three millimeters as our threshold on flex X views. So some authors have changed their definition of four to 4.5 millimeters. And we're starting to kind of split hairs. I'm not sure if I can readily identify the difference between four and 4.5 millimeters just by looking at an x-ray. And of course, there are the uh, classic white and Punjabi criteria for hypermobility. Uh, these are defined as greater than 15 degrees of motion at L1, L4 in the sagittal plane, greater than 20 degrees of motion at L4, 5, and greater than 25 degrees of motion at L5, S1. And I think most of us in this room would agree that this is, these, are, uh, these are in excess of what we feel are physiologic motion. So flexion extension views are certainly helpful in assessing dynamic instability, but they're certainly not the end-all, be-all. Uh, th this is an x-ray of a woman with an L4, 5, grade 2 spondylolisthesis, and I think most of us would call this unstable. But if we're looking specifically at these radiographic criteria, well, there's certainly less than 9 degrees of uh, sagittal angulation, and measuring it out, there's less than 3 millimeters of a translational displacement. But you get this woman in a supine position in the MRI scan, and she all of a sudden reduces. And we can see here, she has a telltale sign of the fluid within the facets in the reduced position. So flex X views don't always tell the entire picture, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not prudent to rely 100% on flexion extension uh, results. This is a patient who has a uh, facet cyst, which is a uh, displacing the fecal sac at the L4-5 level. And on the uh, lateral view, we can see perhaps there's a grade one, maybe a grade half spondylolisthesis. Certainly not what most people would call unstable. And certainly this patient could be optimally treated with a simple laminotomy decompression. Some surgeons might advocate do doing a concurrent fusion at this time. In orthopedics, we know that joint cysts are reflective of joint arthropathy. And unless we under, uh, address the underlying joint arthropathy, this uh, facet cyst is likely to recur, similar to a Baker cyst we see in the knee. You can take out a Baker cyst, but unless you're underlying the joint arthropathy within the knee, it's likely to recur. So some surgeons will advocate fusing this patient. Uh, this is an older patient with a more extensive spondylosis who has a, uh, perhaps a grade one spondylosis at L4-5. And this is really the ideal candidate, in my opinion, for decompression alone. Um, clearly on the flexion extension views, there's no motion there that we can, that's appreciable. But there's also a lot of accompanying degeneration, which has, is actually stabilizing this patient's spine. Degenerative disc disease, uh, osteophytosis, and arthrosis will stabilize this patient's spine. And uh, I think this is an ideal patient for an isolated decompression for degenerative spondylosthesis. Now, there are many forms of decompression. Of course, the gold standard is the facet sparing decompression, which, uh, facet sparing laminectomy, which is a laminectomy where we retain at least 50% of the facets and at least a good six, seven, eight millimeters of PARs bilaterally. 
Um, we can also decompress the spine through laminotomies, and we all know that laminotomies are very similar to laminectomies, except that they preserve the midline structures. And this can be done bilaterally through open bilateral laminotomies, or it can be done uh, unilaterally, the so-called lumbar laminoplasty procedure, or it can be done uh, minimally invasive through a tubular retraction. But we have to be careful. We know that even in patients without any preoperative instability, if we uh, decompress too much, they can develop post-facet sparing laminectomy spondylolisthesis. And while not all of these patients will be symptomatic, these patients are certainly at high risk for having a poor outcome and frequently will, will require revision, decompression, and stabilization. So what's the how often do we see this? The incidence in, in the literature is reported to be 8 to 31 percent of the time of uh, post-facet sparing laminectomy spondylolisthesis. Now in this, these are all in patients who have not had a preoperative spondylolisthesis. So these are people who are reduced. And there are numerous studies which suggest this. And this kind of leads into some of the biomechanical research we've done here at the Univers University of Washington Medical Center. Uh, we looked specifically at the effect of bilateral laminotomy versus laminectomy on the motion and, and stiffness of the human lumbar spine. So our hypothesis was the, that a bilateral laminotomy spine results in less iatrogenic hypermobility and less reduced stiffness as compared to the laminectomized spine. Uh, we used six fresh frozen cadaveric lumbar spines and mounted them on a spine simulator. And this is a load control study um, what were we measure axial rotation, lateral bending, and flexion extension. So we, measured, we assessed three different trials. Trial one was the intact specimen, no surgery. Trial two was the uh, specimen after bilateral laminotomies from L2 to L5. And again, we, this is a resection of the partial lamina above, partial lamina below, uh, partial medial facetectomy, and the ligamentum flavum. Uh, we did retain the central midline structures. And trial three is the laminectomy of L2 to L5, and uh, this is essentially a resection of the uh, midline stabilizing structures. So this is a picture of our trial one. You can see we have these, bio, uh, these reflective spheres attached to each level, and there's, there's been no surgery done on this specimen. This is an oblique picture of trial two after the laminotomies at L2 to L5. You can see they're fairly aggressive laminotomies extending from the superiormost aspect to the inferiormost aspect of the facet. Um, and trial three is after uh, the laminectomy, which is uh, shown here. So what do we find? Well, we, f we found that in flexion extension, Laminotomies resulted in about a 14.3% increase of motion, whereas laminectomies resulted in about a 32.0% increase of motion. And this difference was found to be statistically significant. Uh, we did not observe significant differences for axial rotation or lateral bending. When we look at this uh, data per segment, per motion level, we find that there's almost a two-fold increase in motion with the laminectomy as compared to the laminotomy. And you can see uh, with the uh, error bars that this is uh, significant. What about stiffness? Well, we found that laminotomies resulted in about 11% decrease in stiffness, whereas laminectomies resulted in about a 27% decrease in stiffness of the spine. This difference was found to be statistically significant. So from these data, we can conclude that laminotomies result in less hypermobility hyper and less reduced stiffness than the laminectomies. And the clinical translation or the clinical interpretation of these data is that the bilateral laminotomy procedure may be less likely to predispose to post-decompression spondylolisthesis than a laminectomy. Obviously, in the course of surgical decision making, there are numerous factors which uh, affect our decision. Uh, the severity of stenosis, uh, preoperative mobility, surgical comorbidity. In my hands, a laminotomy procedure takes a little bit more time. And if it's a really sick, older, elderly patient with numerous comorbidities, maybe the better part of valor to just get in, decompress, and get out. Um, other, other factors such as uh, facet tropism, facet orientation, or fluid within the facets may alter the surgeon's decision making regarding what the optim optimal procedure for that patient is. But in summary, um, decompression alone is not indicated for a mobile degenerative spondylolisthesis. Uh, decompression alone is an option in a stable grade one slip. Uh, I think uh, there are numerous factors that go into the decision making regarding laminectomy versus laminotomy. Uh, and I think we always have to be mindful of the possibility of risk of slip progression, even in patients without a preoperative slip. Thank you. Move on to Rick Bransford, who obviously is a working man. Uh, in between cases, he's going to discuss the, the results of non-fusion stabilization for degenerative spondy. Is it here somewhere? Thank you. So um, I was assigned the task of uh, results of non-fusion stabilization, which uh, if you look at the literature here, I think it's, it's very interesting. So I think some of the t uh, highlights we want to go through are, are why do we need these non-fusion techniques or is there any application for these? 
discuss briefly lumbar disc nucleus replacement, look at the various interspinous processes, interspinous spacers that are available, and lastly look at posterior pedicle screw based uh, dynamic stabilization of which there's a whole uh, slew of those. So when we look at fusions historically, there's short-term complications, potentially longer surgery, uh, bone graft complications, long-term complications can be related to donor site pain, pseudarthrosis, and of course the thing that everybody worries about is the adjacent level disease that can come from this. So we look at our various non-fusion technologies. We have uh, various joint repair replacement. We look at artificial discs, uh, various biologics that are on the horizon, <clears throat> nucleus replacements. But really, there's no major role for these in degenerative spondylolisthesis or stenosis because, in general, they don't allow you to, to address the major pathology. We look at dynamic fixation. Most of these are from posterior. We have facet replacement, spinous process spacers, and then flexible pedicle screw constructs. So again, looking at artificial discs and nucleus replacements, uh, there's really no role for these in degenerative spondylolisthesis as by definition, you're probably saying that these are unstable, and to put an artificial disc in there, it will only lead to failure. For most cases of stenosis, you will not be able to get an adequate decompression. And remember that the role, of the, uh, the primary role of artificial disc is in uh, degenerative disc disease uh, and lumbar back pain. We look at uh, posterior approaches, um, uh, where most of these techniques come into play. Uh, they allow us to address the pathology directly. It's a familiar approach to most people. Um, there's an ease of revision should things go wrong and uh, ease of implant at multiple levels, which is often the case looking at stenosis. So let's go over the interspinous uh, spacers that are available. Uh, there's a whole lot on the market, and they have different indications, which I think uh, clouds the literature. We'll focus primarily on X-stop and coflex, and then briefly discuss uh, extensure, Wallace, and diam. The X-stop is probably the most commonly uh, known uh, device available. If you look at it is FDA approved. If you look at the indications, uh, very clear it's for mild to moderate stenosis. And these are patients who their claudication type symptoms are to be relieved, uh, are, is relieved by flexion. There's a study that came out by Richards in 2005 that basically show you, you with the um, X-stop, you increase the central canal diameter by 18% and the foramen by 25%, and that's the mechanism by which this can help with some of the symptoms. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but uh, these are the major studies that are out there. And if you look, there's no level one studies, so there's no controlled randomized um, uh, trials of, out there. The best study probably is this first one by Zuckerman. He has two series of studies, and interestingly, one's a one-year follow-up, one's a two-year follow-up, yet their measuring endpoints are slightly different, and they kind of change their statistics midway. So I think there's a lot of flaws within that, and maybe it really shouldn't even be a level two, these shouldn't be level two studies. In brief, they looked at 191, 191 randomized patients uh, look at conservative versus X-stop and found that patients did better with X-stop, although 60% improvement is not uh, that great. These other ones um, uh, look at Kukta, Anderson, Verhoff. Uh, they all kind of are other studies as well. Interestingly, this last study, if you look at Verhoff's study uh, that came out in 2008, they found a very high failure rate and actually recommended that it not be used at all. So we have evidence here that's kind of moderate at best, um, but conflicting too if you look at some of the smaller studies too that show high rates of X-stop failure. I think the other thing to recognize is that uh, you're asking, these are generally osteoporotic patients, and you're trying to support this on the spinous processes. You can imagine this is just going to melt into the bone and will have a limited lifespan. The Coflex, uh, this is not FDA approved for general use. There is an IDE study underway. Uh, it's listed for a wide range of indications, which I think clouds the data a little bit. The nice thing about this device is you're intended to do a laminectomy underneath this, and so you can see uh, in this picture on the top right how you have your laminectomy hole, um, and then you, you need to leave enough spinous process and enough lamina to support this. The uh, Coflex device then locks underneath the lamina, so you're getting a little bit more load uh, through your lamina itself as opposed to through the spinous processes, and the little fins lock onto the spinous processes to help hold it in place. There's very little uh, studies out there in the literature. The best study, which hopefully will be coming out soon, is this uh, multi-center FDA study of, of 460 patients over four years. Hopefully this is going to be a true level one study, uh, but we're still waiting for the results of that. Otherwise, uh, these other studies, um, really the only one in the literature, and these are all outside the U.S., uh, comes from the uh, uh, Journal of Korean um, uh, that's uh, looked at 41 patients. So there are numerous oral presentations if you've been around uh, NAS or the IMAST or um, uh, various other places that show good early results from this, but I think we still don't know the true answer. Other ones to just mention, there's this extensure. Uh, it's indications for mild to moderate stenosis. There are no clinical studies at all with this. This uses an allograft, and the idea is you get this diffused to the spinous process above and provide a little bit of extension. We have the Wallace. 
Uh, this is a peak spacer. Um, if you look at really the indication for this, this is not for stenosis. It's not for a spondylolisthesis, but it's for degenerative disc disease. And again, very few studies um, of any significance that are out there. There is this prospective randomized trial that's underway. Um, so again, we have low evidence with respect to this. Uh, we have the diam. Again, the, the thing that complicates this one is a wide range of indications, back pain, spondylolisthesis, stenosis. And so I think it muddies the data uh, when you're trying to uh, uh, make heads or tails out of the conclusions. These are the main studies. At best, we have grade three studies, um, all retrospective, uh, most of them small with the exception of the study by Taylor. 88% improvement in pain. And again, this is looking at back pain, so this is not indicated for stenosis, not indicated for spondylolisthesis. So if we look in summary at the interspinous devices, we have evidence is poor or conflicting for all of the devices. There really is nothing out there uh, that gives us anything uh, to work from. Indications of marketing vary with each. I think this clouds the data because when you're trying to interpret what were they really trying to solve with this, um, it's variable and oftentimes they mix uh, back pain with stenosis, uh, with spondylolisthesis all in one study. I think with the interspinous devices, you want to be aware of subsidence, particularly with this has been found with the X-stop, and probably most people have seen this. So it can have a short-term efficacy, but long-term may not be effective. I think my personal bias trying to interpret these data and, and uh, the indications that probably Coflex holds the most promise. Uh, you can at least do a laminectomy underneath this. So you're doing an, a decompression for the stenosis, and your support is coming more from the lamina, not the spinous processes. So this should hopefully uh, increase its lifespan, and I think in Europe they've had pretty reasonable results from that. There's a whole slew of posterior pedicle-based instrumentation. We're going to focus primarily on graph, graph ligamentoplasty and dynasis. Uh, the others are really is, is almost uh, no major study that's out there that really shows anything. The graph ligamentoplasty was introduced in 1992. The idea here is to tension the facets and extension using 8 millimeter uh, braided polyester to kind of help maintain that. The major studies um, uh, came out initially by Graf in uh, 1992. Uh, there are no grade three studies. Most of these are retros all of these are retrospective, and they again show uh, moderate results. There is this study by Rigby that came out in 2001 that was a retrospective study that showed that 21% required revision surgery and 40% would not have surgery again. So again, what studies we have, the evidence is low, and there's a lot of conflict with respect to this. I think you'll find that this really um, has limited indications, if at all. If we look at these kind of in more of a, a summary type slide, I think the main thing here is. So, it does appear that there, you do maintain some type of motion with this, which is kind of one of the goals. The only study that really looked at adjacent level disease was this one here, where we found that with the graft ligamentoplasty, they had a lower rate of adjacent level disease. And this is in a retrospective study over five years. Um, again, if you look at the indications in this column here, back pain, uh, de degenerative spondylolisthesis, varied indications. Again, I think this is part of what clouds this data and makes it difficult to interpret what the indication for this really is. Dynasis is probably the other one, major one that's out there. This was introduced in France in 1994. This uses polyester cords. And the idea is not only to resist flexion, but also to maintain some stability and extension using these cannulated polycarbonate urethane spacers. Number of studies, again, at best we have grade three. You can maybe argue that this prospective study is a grade two study um, that, again, all suggests satisfactory results uh, with a minimal number of patients. There was a study that came out in 2005 that shows that uh, with two-year follow-up, there's no difference in dynasis versus fusion, and that there really was no difference in outcome. This is a similar slide to what we saw before. I think, again, the same sort of issues in summary, varied indications, um, discectomy versus dynasis, degenerative spondylolisthesis. So we're not even treating the same disease process in most of these studies. They really did not look at motion sparing with the exception of this one, um, and really did not look significantly adjacent level disease. Other ones to just maybe mention, uh, but there's no studies out. There's this TOPS, which is a hydroxyapatite screws with an interarticulating, interlocking articular core. Uh, this shows some restoration of motion. Uh, really only one study. It's on 29 patients in a pilot study, so no evidence with respect to this. So we looked at the various other ones that might be out that you may have heard of. There's the graph that we talked about, the dynasis. There's this FAST system that's kind of similar to the graph ligamentoplasty. We have metal-based systems, the isobar, the protex. Uh, the DSS, the Flex Peak, and others, uh, again, trying to maintain, maintain some sort of stability uh, while also maintaining motion. And then there's various hybrid contract, constructs as well. Uh, there's Stable Max, there's Tops, and Agile, which came out that has uh, since then been removed from the market. So I think as we look at this in summary, we have no uh, major evidence to help us uh, with direction. The short to midterm clinical outcome is comparable to fusions and really show no vast differences. 
And as motion retained, there is some suggestion that you can maintain some motion, hopefully uh, prevent adjacent level disease. But uh, I think the verdict is still out with most of these systems. Is it enough to alter adjacent level disease? I don't think we know that. So I think, again, we have no major literature to really give us any sort of guidance at this point in time with respect to any of these systems. Thanks. OK, let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to start the next section talking about spondylolisthesis. Um, this was originally planned to be a debate between Dietrich Schlenska from Finland and, and me. Um, I was going to take the reduction. He was going to take the non-reduction side. Dietrich had something come up uh, family-wise and was unable to make it. Um, I, I, I did include some of Dietrich's data, some really nice studies. Um, however, I didn't really change the tenor of my talk with the hopes that being a little controversial will stir up good decisions. So this is, to some extent, a one-sided debate, which is always a little easier to win. Um, but uh, we'll get started about re the, the, the concept of reduction in the treatment of spondies. Um, a couple of questions up front. Um, for high-grade spondylolisthesis, which is preferable? Full reduction instrumented fusion, partial reduction instrumented fusion, instrumented fusion in situ. I realize there's other questions, but if those are the three choices given, um, let's see what people feel at the beginning of the talk. Okay, partial reduction, and more, slightly more people leaving it in place than pulling it all the way back. Next would be a uh, similar question for low-grade spondees, uh, grade 1 to 2, which is preferable, full reduction instrumental fusion, partial reduction instrumental fusion, instrumental fusion in situ, or non-instrumented fusion in situ. Partial instrumentation. So it's hard to break that pedicle screw habit, isn't it? And then in the surgical management of spondylolisthesis, low grade one to two, the role of anterior column support is critical, important, but optional, or posterior lateral fusion is sufficient. Hmm, interesting. Slight predominance of people favoring some degree of anterior column support, but, but almost half still going solely posterior lateral. Well, I'm going to start a bit in reductio absurdum and start with the high grades and work backwards because I think the high grades illustrate some important points. Now, we know that there are certain anatomical constructs outside of the degree of slip that play a big role in the slip itself and in the response to treatment. Um, increased slip angle, abnormal pelvic incidence are related to higher instability, increased risk of progression, increased risk of post-operative pseudarthrosis. Um, we're really dealing with gravity, that great equalizer for all spine procedures. And, and just as an illustration, obviously, if you have a higher slip angle, the same gravitational vector will result in a stronger anterior displacement force over time. So the idea that, that correcting those angles may result in, in longer-term stability and decreased risk of acute and long-term side effects certainly bears out just looking at the effects of gravity on the, the anatomy. And actually, it's a fairly complex problem. Um, not only do we have the anterolisthesis of, of the body, but we also have the rotation of the body, and that increases usually as the degree of deformity increases. We also have abnormal angulation of the sacrum pelvis, uh, which plays a role in that deformity and also plays a role in the resu re results of surgery. Then we get abnormal uh, response of the bone to that slip, with, uh, abnormal uh, uh, contours of the adjacent vertebral bodies. And then we get compensatory changes, such as the increased lordosis in compensation in order to keep a sagittal balance. And that sort of thing not only plays initially on the, the construct, but also will have long-term consequences of those anatomic constraints as the patient ages, particularly into the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, <clears throat> the clinical presentation is varied, crouched gait, neurologic deficit, relatively rare in children. Tight hamstrings, very common in kids. Prominent spinous processes, lumbar hyperlidosis, and back pain. 
Mechanical abnormalities we see that are associated with increased risk of progression in pseudoarthrosis, high slip angle, high sacral, high sacral uh, in, uh, inclination, and kyphosis. What can be treated without reduction is really what pa usually brings the patient there. In general, they do come because of either a neurologic deficit or back pain. And those can certainly get better without altering all of the, the mechanics, without altering the x-rays all that much. Um, now, that's absolutely more true in the young, young people because the influence of those abnormalities tends to become more important as we age. And in true, of course, we all age. We all get older. And I think that's one of the catches in the literature as it stands is what happens in the long run to this residual deformity when you start reaching periods where your, your compensatory mechanisms are, are diminished. Um, you can fuse in situ, clearly. What are the problems with in situ fusion? It's associated with increased fusion failure, instrumentation failure, and the possibility of progression. And then there's this long-term consequence, and, and the, these are actually quite anecdotal. Um, there aren't that many of these people around. There aren't that many that come to the same group. Um, and so you don't see a lot of the long-term consequences of reduced or, or non-reduced fusions. Um, certainly bone is not concrete and it's not metal and, and it can remodel even with a solid fusion. And, and I've seen a number of cases that managed to come up with their films from 30 years ago where you can see solid fusion and Bowman dowels, etc., but the patients actually migrated around them. And then there's the other bit about the consequences of a neurologic course. And I, I think all those remember the post-polio syndrome, when people do well after polio, and then as they age, they begin to lose their reserve, and they start to become symptomatic again. Well, these patients who come in with a solid fusion, and you can see here, they did a good job of trying to resect the posterior uh, prominence. But even then, it's a fairly abnormal course, and these people come in with these strange urologic problems that aren't really fixable. They're fused and... and and it's not really fixable. Now, this is entirely anecdote. And most of these patients I inherited from having trained with Steve Garfin. And in the long run, we saw a lot of people get referred to a lot of these people um, who had various types of fusion at various types of centers in the long run. And I guess now they're following me to Seattle because I see a fair number of these. Entirely anecdote. But I think there's a big difference of what happens in your 50s and 60s. Um, you can certainly reduce high grade and get away with it. Um, that, uh, there's a lot of rumors that it doesn't work, that it's really dangerous. Um, Serena Hu, uh, Uli Bus, uh, and, and Larson all published series, relatively small. There were issues about instrumentation failure. Uh, Serena's uh, group with Bradford used the Edwards instrumentation, which is really good to reduce, but terrible to get fusion. That, that probably accounts for that, but they certainly had only had one neurologic deficit that didn't result. Uh, uh, Bose's study, no post-operative neurologic deficits, and their hardware failure was exactly associated with whether or not they got interbody support. Same with Larson's series, no post-operative neurologic defects, excellent uh, outcomes, they included an ALIF. So the influence of reduction of high-grade slips, are, it seems to be effective in reducing the predictors of progression, and the neurologic deficits appear overestimated. I mean, the one thing you hear is you don't reduce them because you get L5 redix. But they do occur, certainly. They seem to be rarely permanent, and there isn't a huge literature supporting the, the high estimates that you tend to hear in terms of rumor. Um, it seems that they should involve rigid instrumentation supplemented with anterior support for the high grades. Um, now, there was a quote-unquote meta-analysis done a number of years ago looking at, at lower-grade uh, ismic spondy in response to the Cochrane report suggesting that there is no benefit from instrumented fusion. And the one thing that was noted in that report was that the, uh, the, the, the utility of anterior column support, studies that focused on the addition of anterior column support, weren't really analyzed. So the issue was, is did the Cochrane um, report actually reflect what we are doing nowadays, what we tend to be more and more doing. And, and this analysis suggests maybe it should have. Now, this is not a true meta-analysis. This is an assessment of a bunch of papers and concatenation of data. It didn't go back and get the source data, which is really the meat of a true meta-analysis. But it's still a pretty useful uh, 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 report. And in that, when they looked at combined versus posterior, what they found was clearly there was a statistical advantage to combined in terms of radiographic fusion and clinical results. When they looked at combined versus anterior, they found there was a statistical difference in radiographic fusion, that anterior radiographic fusion, but there was no difference in patient outcome. In other words, if you got anterior support with or without 
posterior support, the patients tended to do well. Posterior versus anterior was a little different. They both appeared to fuse, but the patients liked the anterior antibody. At least it was a core, their report of satisfaction was associated with it, getting that anterior antibody support. The conclusion there was that the highest rate of radiographic fusion and successful clinic outcomes was associated with the use of anterior support. And I know subjectively the incidence of screw pullout and instrumentation failure really kind of became minimal after we started focusing on getting that anterior support. So no matter what you're doing, it's reasonable to consider that. Unfortunately, what we really need to do is go back and do the whole uh, data analysis looking at anterior support in terms of a Cochrane report. The loss of neutral sagittal balance is also important. If you don't correct the anatomy, they stay out of, out of balance. And we know that that's important in, in that they end up tending to compensate. You can compensate within the spine by lumbar hyperlordosis or extraspinal by hip rotation. Now notably, of course, both of these decrease with age. And as we get more and more elderly, we lose the ability to get hyperlordotic. We lose the ability to externally rotate our hips and we tend to kyphos. Certainly time is kyphosing in itself. Is sagittal balance important? I think we pretty much agree that it is, and, and that patient satisfaction in deformity tends to correlate with the degree of sagittal correction, and undercorrection is associated with poor subjective report of outcome. Now, Dietrich Schlenske would argue, based on his study, that you don't need to reduce these, and this was a treatment of severe spondylolisthesis in adolescents with reduction or in situ fusion long-term outcome. And this is, a, again, a benefit of the Scandinavian systems where they can follow these patients for a long time and find out how they do. These patients were retrospectively matched for high-grade slip only. 22 patients averaged 14.7 years, mean follow-up of 15 years, 11 reduced, 11 not. Now you can see here that the ones who were reduced started out with a high, with higher degree of slip and a higher lumbar sacral kyphosis. And you can also notice, and I think this is important, that despite 14 or 15 years of follow-up, they're 29 years, they're under 30 at this long-term follow-up. They're still pretty young, 30 years, you can still compensate for a lot. And their results, though, were, were somewhat impressive. They, they really found no difference. There were differences in two indices, which were pain and post-op function. Um, however, they had no baseline data, no preoperative data, so this was they didn't have a, a difference score. And the overall complaint of pain in both groups was fairly minimal. So I think the interpretation of that is that there was really no difference in those two groups with long-term follow-up in our young patient cohort. They certainly achieved uh, anatomic correction. The degree of slip was remarkably better in those that they attempted to reduce. And although not statistically significant, they had a 10 point uh, change in the lumbar sacral kyphosis, which is pretty significant when you think of that rotation in terms of long-term outcomes. Complications were pretty similar. Um, they did use traction before operation in the non, in the in situ group, and they ended up with similar degrees of complications, both neurologic and, and construct. So really, in summary, uh, it's a very good study, but personally I would wait for what happens when these patients get more elderly. There's probably no difference in outcome between the two groups. You get better anatomic restoration with the, the reduction, and is there a difference in neurologic injury? It doesn't really appear so. And then again, what happens in their 40s and 50s? Now, the only way to correct the sagittal balance is reduction. Does this happen in lower grades? Well, we can look. Um, realigning the spine, including the segments above the lesion, Improving posture and avoiding increased stress on adjacent segments, does that happen in the lower grades? It certainly appears to. Um, this is just an example of pre- and post-operative uh, L4-5 uh, slip, and you can see that the, the pelvic incidence has changed and that the, the compensatory hyperlidosis has diminished. And certainly, I think that's what you want to see in your long-term patients when they come back. Also, opening the neural foraminae. In the non-reduced situation, you can get them solid, but postoperative the neural foraminate re often remain compressed. After reduction, the neural foraminate tend to be larger. Now, not all these patients are going to get better. And the real problem with me is when someone comes back with still some root irritation and I didn't do a reduction, and this is what I see, I wonder, had I done a reduction, would they have been better? And I never know, but it's much easier to talk to them about that when that's what the picture is. And so I really like to see that x-ray when I'm discussing it with these patients. And then finally, realigning the aesthetic segments improves inner body grafting. It's just simpler to get a graft in when they're better aligned. And if you believe in anterior inner body support, that becomes important. 
And it's actually, uh, there, I mean, there are disadvantages, but in the low grade, it, it really only takes a few minutes to reduce these. And the neurologic complications, I, I think actually 18% uh, is an overestimate in the high grades, certainly overestimate in the term of long-term deficit. And there's really no data on the low-grade slips. For my own series, almost 200 patients, um, no prolonged <coughs> neurologic deficits. Interestingly, a number of delayed deficits that came on and were actually fairly painful are resolved in uh, three weeks and eight weeks. Um, high grade and redos, of course, are, are a bit riskier. And with modern instrumentation, it's actually fairly straightforward. Reducing a low grade slip can simply be done by adjusting the screws, putting the two screws in at different depths, aligning the rod so that it's above the, the lysthetic segment, and then using a, a reduction tool simply to lift the rod up into position and then locking it in place. It doesn't really take much extra time and allows a pretty good reduction using a barely basic in instrument set. If it doesn't achieve the proper reduction in the first step, you can repeat it by merely loosening the cap, rotating the bars in, increasing the depth of the screw, and then repeating the reduction. It's really quite simple. It can actually be done on fairly high grades. This was a very mobile young man where we actually used some bent rods initially, reduced to those, and sequentially went to straight rods and got a fairly good outcome in that. As I'm not recommended, but this guy was fairly loose to start with. Fairly simple procedure, one segmental fusion, segment fusion, and that's the long-term outcome uh, uh, on the right patient did actually quite well. With higher grades, it's a little more difficult, of course. And in those cases, sometimes you need sequential reduction over a long period of time with a lot of control. In that case, using shan screws with reduction threads, over which you can add a threaded reduction sleeve and a reduction cap, um, can allow you to slowly but surely turn that down over time, gradually reducing the slip. At the same time, you can alter the angles because you do have that angular control with, this, with these and achieve sequential reduction in the really high grades, probably six to eight hours. Like Chuck Edwards recommended to do this, varying things, plastic creep. And you can achieve pretty good reduction over time with that technique as well. And again, this is a case of previously failed surgery that went from a grade two to a grade uh, four plus. Um, osteoporosis pulled out sides, you actually had to glue the screws in, but over a period of eight hours we got a relatively reasonable reduction on that. And so it actually isn't that hard to do if you have the patients in, with modern hardware. So I guess what I would ar argue is that reducing spondylolisthesis is relatively straightforward, certainly harder in the higher grades, improves the bi biomechanics, sp important especially for the long run quality of life. Incident of nerve root injury is real, but actually quite low and, and tends to be transient aids inner body fusion, and prevents very late deterioration. Thank you. Help no questions? Um, did you do the posterior part first, the reduction, and then went to the anterior to do I, the bone grafting? A lot of times I try to do them all from, the, all from the back during the time. If I get a good reduction, I can easily get a graft in, even high grades. If I don't get it, I can almost never get a possible graft in from the, from the back. Um, in, in the latter case, we did end up going to the back because it took a long time and, and the blood loss was high enough. We needed to do it by a second stage procedure. Hmm. In the ones I don't reduce, a lot of times we'll put bowl and dowels through them, but sometimes you go from the front and put subsequent dowels in backwards or or do a bit of a takedown and try to get inner body graft in. But for the most part, our practice here is, is to do it with a T-lift or PLIF approach uh, after the instrumented reduction. And do you brace him? Uh-uh. Okay. Instrument failure is not common, but the problem seems to be around the S1 screws. You saw him sketch off. Speaking to the instrumentation, and uh, the problems with the S1 screws, is osteoporosis something we should be looking at before we count on an S1 screw to hold a three-level fusion? Or when do you think about going to the pelvis? You know, um, we do a lot of things because we can do them and because we think more is better. Um, and and I'm, tr I'm personally on a little bit of a goal to, to tr try not to do that. Um, my, my personal impression over having done a fair number of these and tried to avoid going to the pelvis is that when I can line them up and get them back into a reasonable sagittal balance um, with good inner body support, I have not, knock on wood, had much trouble with those S1 screws. Sometimes I'll add an S2 ailer screw uh, 
but rather than make, rather than end up going to the pelvis, I've tried not to do that. If I don't get them reduced, if there's really a lot of osteoporosis, um, or I'm unhappy at all with, with it, then I think it's very reasonable to go to the pelvis. But to some, I mean, it's not necessarily a free ride to add that extra fixation on the extra time, et cetera. So I personally think that if you can stack someone up and, and load share anteriorly, once you get good anatomic uh, reduction in sagittal balance, that that takes the load off of those screws to a great extent. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Jiang from Canada. I have a question. Uh, do you routinely expose the you know, bilaterally the superior nerve root and middle nerve root? When you do the re reduction, do you have to watch what's going on with those nerves? You know, a lot of these deficits show up a day later or even two days later, um, not at the time. And that's one of the reasons that evoked potential monitoring doesn't keep you out of trouble on these. And there is an argument not to fully reduce but to stop at grade one because of that, because there tends to be something that happens later. Yeah, I clean it out. I watch it. I try to avoid tension. I take a long time in achieving the reduction. But but unfortunately, even with that, I see, uh, I see deficits come on in 24, 48 hours later. They tend to be transient, but you, know, you never want to see a deficit given for what you did. You, if you stop, I think it is certainly the last 25% of reduction. So it's sometimes reasonable to stop at a grade one and uh, be okay with that. It, the, 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 it's completely different with the low grades. Those are pretty safe and easy to pull back. Yeah, the other questions I feel is uh, going to be uh, put uh, quite a bit of uh, stress if you uh, do L5, S1 level, S1 screw is going to be under uh, quite a bit of uh, stress to uh, routinely do our tricortical fixation on, on S1. Yes, yeah, I'm a big fan of tricortical fixation and also a big fan, much I hate to say it, of gluing the screws in um, above if you're going to do a high grade reduction. That kind of commits you <laughs> to being successful, um, but uh, you get a lot more pullout strength if you do that. Do you have to uh, uh, use more fixation inferiorly and put it temporary as two or go, go to the... Yeah, as I was saying with TED, um, I, really I, I try to start with something solid, tricortical graft, sometimes with ALR screws, sometimes with just with the extension of the rod and hooks into the foramina. Um, I don't always leave that. Sometimes at the end, if I'm happy with my construct, I'll shorten it. But uh, if I have any worries, yeah, I think you go to the crest or, uh, I mean, to the pelvis or to uh, leave in the S2 fixation. Thank you.